Welcome to part two of the Tao of Digital, an introduction to the fundamentals of modern photo imaging. I'm Lee Veris, here again to explore some more basic concepts. This time we're going to look at color management and how we control color in digital images. Okay, so, so tell me if this has ever happened to you. You have taken this lovely portrait on your vacation and you send it out for a large print, but when it comes back, it looks like this, WTF, and you just spent over a hundred dollars. Okay, all right. So my mom thinks this looks good, but really, why is it so different? When things like this happen, it's nine times out of ten some kind of color management failure. So let's look into this. First, an overview. We're going to look at what color management is, what it's not, and how we use it. I'm going to start with what color management is not. Uh, these are some terms I often see associated with color management, but these things actually do not come under the color management umbrella. Color management is not color matching. It is not color correction, and it is not color calibration. Okay, so color management does have the same word color, but as far as color matching goes, color management cannot actually match colors between different devices because all different devices are different. They can never match. An LCD monitor makes color in a completely different way than a camera captures color and a completely different way than a printer represents color. We might be able to use color management to get a reasonable match between two monitors, but definitely not between a monitor and a printer. Viewing conditions change. Color management is designed to describe only one viewing condition, and that's D50, which is a specific artificial standard for daylight. And finally, the idea of good color from a human perspective is not necessarily scientifically accurate, and it's a moving target. Color management is not the same thing as color correction. Color correction is a human creative activity. Colors are always evaluated in context, and this feature of the human visual system is what is responsible for optical illusions, and we're going to look at some of these in a minute. Because of this, the human artist must decide what color should look like in an image. A machine by itself cannot do this automatically. So let's look at a few interesting optical illusions. In this classic one, only humans can see the difference between the A and B squares. In actual measured values, they are exactly the same tone and color. It looks like one diagonal is made out of magenta squares and the other is made out of red squares. Clearly, the two sets of squares are different, but they measure exactly the same. And take a look at the interlocking wave pattern here. Did you see that these little half circles are the same? All of these optical illusions exploit the human visual system's insistence on referencing colors to their immediate neighbors in a way that forces more contrast into the image. Oddly, this feature of the human visual system is what makes it hard for people to accurately evaluate color and makes it necessary to use color management. More on this later. Probably the biggest mistaken idea is that color management is the same thing as color calibration. Calibration is when we adjust some kind of hardware to a standard condition, uh, like neutralizing a display so that it renders gray in a reasonably accurate way. This is used to ensure consistency and is necessary to make color management work, but it's actually not part of color management itself. So just what is color management? Well, color management helps us achieve process control. It is a way of measuring colors and sharing those measurements so that we can compare the performance of all the color hardware in the imaging chain. It is a method of tracking color changes from one device to another, and it's a technology for converting color numbers from one color space to another. So in process control, we need a profile to describe the specific color behavior of a device, 
be it a monitor or a printer, so that we can track the device's behavior over time. Clearly, we cannot calibrate anything properly if we cannot tell how it is changing. And because devices are never perfect, they will always change over time regardless of hardware calibration, we need some me method of describing how each device represents color, even in a changed state. In order to achieve this tracking, we need to, a way to define colors independently from any device. Then, and only then, can we compare the color rendering from one device to another. Once we can accurately compare colors between devices, we can decide how to compromise on the final color rendering to accommodate our intent. Remember, color rendering will change from one type of device to another. It's, it's unavoidable. While we know that color rendering will change through any conversion process that takes us from one color space to another, we still need some way to connect the colors in one space to the colors in another in a meaningful way. This is where color management profiles come in. This connection process correlates the numbers of one space, one color space, to the numbers of another color space through profiles that describe how the numbers in each color space represent color. By using these profile descriptors, maximum color integrity is preserved by changing the numbers according to the colors those numbers represent. Well, <clears throat> has your head exploded yet? Not yet? Okay, just wait. It gets better. So we use profiles to describe the colors that different devices produce. This requires a standard method to define color. The problem is defining color in a way that allows us to correlate between two disparate color rendering devices. We're going to examine this using one example in a moment. There are various possible solutions to this dilemma, but in contemporary practice, we use a standard method of color management to provide a solution. There are two device-dependent ways of representing color for digital images, and two scenarios for color display where the numerical interpretation of color comes into play. Input color spaces, scanners and cameras, which always capture an RGB, an additive color space, and output color spaces, which are monitors and printers. And monitors are still in RGB, but printers are most often some kind of CMYK color space, which is a subtractive color space. There's an, an additional scenario where we use numerically interpreted color spaces, and that is the workspace used for editing images in Photoshop. The two categories of device independent and device dependent also play out here. The device independent workspace is either RGB, the familiar sRGB or Adobe RGB as an example, and LAB a very odd workspace that's more important in another context that we'll talk about later. The device-dependent workspace is CMYK, all but forgotten by photographers these days, but still valuable. You'll see choices like uh, Swap V2, uh, Gray Call, uh, Fogra, etc. Usually a dizzying number of incomprehensible acronyms followed by numbers. Photographers rarely need to edit images in CMYK, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. RGB is the most important color space in digital imaging. This is an additive color space. By that, I mean that the brightness values of the three channels of red, green, and blue are added together to create every possible color in a given workspace. In the subtractive color space of CMYK, colors are subtracted from white, typically in the process of laying down small dots of ink, such that cyan, magenta, and yellow ink darken from white in a way that blends together to create a range of colors. We need a fourth color of black to add enough contrast uh, and density to get an appropriate range of colors on the white paper. Uh, the difference between the three sets of RGB numbers and the four sets of CMYK numbers clearly illustrates the problem in converting from one color space into another. 
it's the disparity between the different sets of numbers that becomes problematic for any meaningful conversa conversion <laughs> or conversation. The solution that's pretty much universally adopted lies in the software technology developed by Apple computers. Originally, it was called ColorSync, and now just mostly referred to as color management. This solution has been standardized by the International Color Consortium, a collection of the largest graphics industry manufacturers like Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, HP, Epson, etc. It uses a device-independent color encoding standard called C-Lab, C-I-E-L-A-B, commonly referred to as L-A-B or Lab. Yes, it's the same lab used as a Photoshop workspace. Color management uses Lab as a connection space between RGB and CMYK, or RGB and some other flavor of RGB. It does this using a color lookup table, or CLUT. The ICC, or in Windows, we must say ICM, profile is basically a color lookup table that looks up the LAB value of a given set of numbers, be they RGB or CMYK. Again, LAB, or LAB, is a three-channel device-independent color space where the L channel represents lightness, darks and lights in the image, and the two A and B channels represent the color alone. LAB can encode every color that is visible to humans and theoretical colors beyond human vision. This is necessary to allow LAB to connect between all av other available color spaces in a mathematically efficient way. Okay. So, you might want to pause this video to recover some sanity, scoop up all the exploded brain tissue, and get it back into your head. Okay, pushing through all the exploded heads out there, a color lookup table, CLUT, or sometimes simply LUT for lookup table, is used to change one set of numbers into another. This is what an ICC or ICM profile is, a color lookup table. These cluts are bi-directional, essentially going to and from LAB. The A side goes from the source color space A to LAB, and the B side goes from LAB to the destination color space B. Okay. So, a profile has a lookup table that moves in two directions to LAB and from LAB. We need two profiles to move colors from one device to another, here represented by the red arrows. The A side of device A's profile looks up the color represented by a specific number and returns a specific LAB value. Then the B side of device B's profile looks at that LAB value and returns its device specific number. A typical scenario is how colors get represented on a monitor. You have your device independent workspace numbers run through um, a LUT, a lookup table, to return LAB number. And then the, the monitor profile runs that LAB number through its LUT to return the monitor specific number to represent the closest color. A lot of very complicated things happen when the monitor cannot re reproduce the exact LAB color asked for and some kind of substitution occurs. The ultimate goal is to control how any sub substitution occurs such that the least amount of visual damage occurs. If you look at the whole color chain, you can see that the process goes through lots of transformations, and all of these transforms affect our ability to make creative decisions regarding color. Without a good set of color profiles in place, we would be completely lost. So we have the camera, workspace, monitor, and finally the printer. A lot of transforms. So scary, huh? Uh, just how do we get ourselves some good profiles? Well, these days, reasonably good profiles are fairly easy to be found, 
and you as a photographer don't have to get too involved in actually creating too many profiles from scratch. To create a profile, you need to scan or shoot a target for an input profile or display or print a target for an output profile. The only profiling activity photographers absolutely need to concern themselves with is the monitor profile, and that is automatically generated during the calibration process. I'll show you that pro process in a minute, but first, let's look at how we interact with profiles in Photoshop. Most of the time our interaction with color management profiles is sort of a set and forget kind of affair. We do this mostly in the color settings in Photoshop. Okay, so here we are in Photoshop and uh, I want to edit my color settings. So I'm going to go down from the edit menu here to color settings. Now I already have some color settings in place, uh, but when you first find this uh, dialog here, uh, you have a choice here in, in picking a bunch of different uh, presets. The normal preset that we see uh, is the North American general purpose. Okay, so, so this is what, if you never go into color settings, it'll be already set up like this when you open this dialog. And we see here that the working space for RGB is sRGB. Our CMYK is US web coded SWAT V2. And we have gray and spot, you know, these are dot gain percentages, those are all in there. And our color management uh, policies here are preserve embedded profiles all the way across, but we don't have uh, pro profile mismatches checked here. Okay, so generally speaking, what I would recommend is making a slight change to the general purpose uh, settings and just check these. Uh, this lets us know if we open a file that is not in, in our uh, default workspace, it'll let us know. Otherwise, everything else is uh, it, you can just sort of leave alone. There's some advanced controls here. Um, you can leave this little, uh, this is default, the check the blend text colors using this gamma. Uh, it, you know, it's generally only useful for designers. Photographers don't need to be concerned about this. Otherwise, everything else is, is like fairly esoteric and advanced, and you're better off just leaving it alone. Um, the other possible choice here um, is um, if, if you change from sRGB to Adobe RGB. Some people like to work in a, a slightly larger color gamut. I would recommend uh, not going any larger than Adobe RGB. Uh, we'll talk about this in another video, but don't ever use Profoto RGB. You'll see here in our settings presets, if you select um, North American Pre-Press, you'll pretty much get uh, the recommended uh, workspace, uh, certainly Adobe's recommended workspace, which gives you Adobe RGB and all these uh, ask when opening things checked. Okay, so that's basically the, a very safe way to set this up. Just select North American pre press or if you're like me and you just want to work in a slightly more constrained color space you can use sRGB. Make sure you have these things checked. And basically uh, that's it. Now the only unique profiling process that photographers have to do on a regular basis is calibrate and profile their monitor. The profiling part of this process is fairly automatic, and the calibration part is easy as long as you have the hardware and software to do an effective job of it. Essentially, you use software to display specific colors and tones on your screen, and you use hardware to read those values, adjust the display, and build a profile. I'll demonstrate this process using one of the popular monitor profiling packages. Okay, so I am uh, using the Spider Elite uh, profiler right here. And uh, we, basically we have this sort of wizard uh, um, uh, display here that tells you what to do, okay? And uh, you just kind of click through it and it, it gives you an idea, okay, you choose the display that we're gonna calibrate and uh, the make and model, the type of display. We're not doing a projector, we're doing a desktop here. Uh, 
this is the display manufacturer. Uh, this is the model. It's already entered there for us. We don't have to worry about it. Um, we indicate, you know, what controls the display offers. So the, the display offers brightness, and it, I think mine has Kelvin presets, but I'm just going to go ahead and ignore that. Um, full calibration of the display. I, I would recommend just staying with these presets. A lot of times uh, manufacturers have, you know, the, 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 the display calibrators have presets. These are very reasonable. However, I would make one change here for the brightness. Instead of uh, 120, um, I would select 100. Um, usually, I think people have their displays set too bright. It kind of depends on your room ambient lighting. They recommend 120 for sort of normal room ambient lighting, uh, which is fairly bright. I prefer to work in a fairly dim environment, so I get my lights turned down and I work in a fairly dark room. If that's the case, then I would recommend using a, a lower brightness level. Okay, so we move on. It gives you a, a, a sort of a visual here. Um, and you know, it says, okay, here's your device. Okay, place this the spider on the desk, you know, as, as shown. This one has a little uh, container that it just clicks into. So we, we, once we get it set up like that, we just click on next and uh, it will take a room light, you know. So as, as I mentioned before, I like to work in a fairly dim environment. So this is moderately low. Um, and they're saying brightness of 120. Okay, well, I still think 100 is better. Um, but you can either keep the settings that you selected or accept the recommended. We'll go ahead and accept the recommended settings here. All right. So uh, it's saying, okay, here it's giving instructions here. Stay at your computer after you click the next button on the screen, the application. The, you know, a lot of these... Uh, uh, applications have uh, sort of default messages. We're not going to show that again. I'll just say OK. But here you can see it says place the spider here. Now you're not going to be able to see this part because I'm you know, doing a screen movie here. But basically I'm just getting my, uh, my monitor calibrator set up in that position on the display. And then I click on Next. And what the, the software for the uh, calibrator does is it displays these different colors on the screen. So we get a white, we get a black, and uh, it's measuring these values. And we'll go through a process to adjust the lookup table that is used to send the color numbers to the display. So we measure all these values. It's going to flash this up on the screen. Um, some hardware is faster than others, um, and it measures quicker. Uh, some takes a little more time, depending on uh, various preferences that you may select in your your preferred calibration system. Uh, it could take longer or less time. I'm using uh, the most uh, thorough. So here it's telling me that I can adjust my screen brightness. At this stage you would adjust the hardware in your uh, on your monitor to adjust the brightness until it, it lines up with the target value here. So I, right now it's it's a little dim. I would like, need to adjust it up to make it brighter to, until it lines up with the green squares. I'm going to... Okay, so you know, I've adjusted the hardware uh, to, to change the brightness value so that I've got my target uh, value and my the current brightness is, is close enough. I mean, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Um, but uh, now I have them sort of much more or less matching. I'm going to go ahead and continue here. Now, it refines the brightness uh, using the lookup table to adjust, and it's measuring the values again. So it's going to go through this whole iterative process of measuring the values and adjusting uh, the lookup table while it's doing that. 
So in, in essence, it's it's measuring the value that it gets, and it's comparing it to the expected value that it's you know wants to create. And where it doesn't match, it'll make an adjustment using the lookup table to change the numbers a little bit that it's sending to the to the display. And it's also attempting to create some uh, adjustment for the hardware. So although we manually adjusted the brightness, it will go and do its the best that it can to adjust for any hardware deficiencies uh, to try and get the, the monitor performing as best as it possibly can. So we're not going to wait for all of the color changes to happen here. Uh, but in essence, it's going to flash all these different colors on the screen until it's done uh, and done measuring all the different color changes. All right, we're, we're nearing the end of the measuring process here. And um, the better uh, monitor calibration systems spend a lot of time measuring gray levels. So at this point, uh, we're displaying a lot of different gray values, and it's really important to get a, a good neutral uh, on your monitor. So uh, the, the software hardware combination that spends a bit more time measuring gray values is always going to be a little bit better. And uh, I've been pretty happy with the data color spider here. Um, seems to do a pretty good job of, of getting me a, a fairly uh, neutral gray rendering across the whole scale from white to black. And uh, so, and, and I really think, feel that's the most critical thing about monitor calibration is getting a good neutral. Okay, it says please remove your spider and we will do that. And click on finish and now we have a profile that we can save and we can get the calibrator to remind us every month. I, I, I recommend that you do it at least once a month. Um, you know, if you're if you're really lazy, you can go two months, but really once a month is sort of, the, I would consider the minimum uh, to get uh, to keep your monitor in the best performance possible. So we'll just save it. And your new profile has been saved. And we can click and see a preview uh, of the calibrated, you know, what the calibrated display looks like with a set of, you know, kind of pre preset uh, standard images. And if we click on it, we can see that's the uncalibrated state. You can see the colors a little bit, maybe a little bit different. That's the uh, calibrated state. And uh, then we're basically looking at some, you know, kind of graph data. So we can see that uh, the monitor is the red outline and uh, the green outline is the sRGB. So this monitor is very close, not exactly, but very close to sRGB. Let's see where it is relative to Adobe RGB. And as expected, Adobe RGB has some colors which are outside of that, you know, that red line, which is the monitor's color gamut. The Adobe RGB is a bit beyond what the, uh, the monitor can display. And this is pretty typical. Even really good monitors are not capable of displaying more than 98%. So there's always at least a little bit of Adobe RGB that cannot be displayed on any monitor. Uh, one of the reasons I prefer to use sRGB, actually. But uh, anyway, we're all good to go. Print profiling. Okay, is a topic that is a bit beyond the scope of this tutorial, but I will mention just a few things about it here. Mostly the choices for the photographer involve printing to your own personal printer or vending out your prints to an outside service. If you print yourself, you have to learn how to use your printer driver to set up the appropriate profiles for the paper you are using. Depending on the model of the printer you use, this can be confusing and time consuming. If you stick with the manufacturer's branded paper, the profile is available and installed with a printer driver software. It's, it's just a matter of choosing the correct profile. Specialty papers or off-brand papers are another story, and this may require you to get custom profiles or to learn how to do that yourself. Printer driver interfaces are notoriously confusing and involve lots of drop-down menus and settings. If you can find a setting for color handling, uh, make sure you choose to allow Photoshop uh, to manage the colors. OK, 
okay? This gives you proper control over the choice of printer profiles according to the paper you're using. It often takes quite a bit of experimentation to figure out all the necessary control settings to use, but once you've done that, you can save the settings in a preset that can be used over and over again. When dealing with outside vendors, make sure you supply files the way they want. Communication is the key. Uh, general recommendations include make sure you have a profile attached to your images and you have them in a standard workspace. If you are sending RGB files, you will have fewer problems if they are sRGB because most vendors output defaults to sRGB, so mistakes won't be catastrophic. Make sure you have enough resolution for the output. If you're not sure, ask. Finally, don't make your images too dark. One of the most common complaints is that prints tend to look much darker than what you see on the monitor. Now this is as much a human perception issue as it is a color management issue. White paper is not as bright as a backlit monitor. No amount of color management can compensate for misjudgments of brightness on a monitor. Learn to read and understand the numbers in your file and you can avoid costly mistakes. So let me show you what I mean by reading the numbers in Photoshop. Okay, so here we are in Photoshop and um, what I'm going to do, you know, I have this set up here so that my info panel here is in the upper right. I like to set up my uh, my palettes this way. I have another tutorial here on, on setting up Photoshop preferences that will show you how to get this set up like this. But right now I'm just going to talk about the info panel. And you see here we have RGB right over here and CMYK over here. Now, RGB, this is the first color readout. This would be the default readout for an RGB file. It would be the colors in the file. It normally would be RGB. And then the secondary color readout, uh, by default, it's set up for CMYK. Um, now, you can change these color readouts. If I click on this little eyedropper tool here, I can actually get a drop-down menu where I can change the color readout. So what I'm going to do is change it to LAB. Now, LAB will allow me to get a, a value for the L, which is a brightness value. So what I like to do just to learn how those L numbers relate to images is what, I, what I'll do is I'll make a new image. And uh, we'll, we'll make this, this is going to be our, uh, we'll, we'll call this our zone um, scale. Okay. So I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make an LAB document. So I'm I'm selecting the color mode here to be LAB, and my width uh, let's let's call it uh, we'll call it like uh, we'll make it uh, like 1,200 pixels, and then that, we only need a, a strip. So let's let's make this uh, like 300 pixels. Okay, LAB white. Uh, it, because it's LAB, there's no profile associated with this. Okay, so we, we say OK, and we get a document like this. All right. So so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a step wedge that has ten steps in it. So let's uh, let's uh, let's figure this out here. I'm going to uh, select just the lightness channel. So I go into the channels panel here and I just click on lightness. So I'm only going to be editing the L channel here. There's a little bug in LAB. If I have all the channels selected when I do this next step, I'll introduce some odd colors, but I just want to have brightness from black to white. So I'm selecting the L channel. And now I'm going to get my gradient tool here and I'm going to select the the uh, let's get before I do anything else I'm going to put black and white I'm going to click on the default colors there in my my uh, tool panel here so I have black in the foreground white in, there in the background and I'm going to select the gradient type that gives me black to white okay so that's the first choice foreground to background so the foreground is black the background is white so I'm going to use a linear gradient Okay, so I've got that choice right there. That's a linear gradient that's selected in the tool options. 
normal. My opacity is going to be 100%. Uh, I'm going to be using dither. Actually, no, I'm going to uncheck dither. This is important because I want to get some clean steps. You'll, you'll, it'll become apparent uh, later on why I'm doing this. But right now, I'm going to, I'm going to drag the gradient across this LAB document. So we start over here, and if I hold down the shift key, I can constrain this to exactly a uh, horizontal. So I'm going from black to white, and I create a gradient. Okay, Again, it's only in the lightness channel. So it's just black to white, no color in this at all. All right, next step is I'm going to go over here from Image to Adjustments and Posterize. So I'm going to posterize this to a level 11. So why 11? 11 gives me, um, it's 11 steps, but it puts a, a step right in the middle that's 50%. So we say, OK. And uh, now I'm going to go back and select all the channels again. And when we, we move our cursor around, you can see up here, the, see how the L value changes. So here we have 0. So that's absolute black. The next step is 10. So that's 10% brightness. The next one's 20, 30, 40. There's our 50% right in the middle. So we have four steps below 50% and four steps above it. So that's why we need 11 steps. So there's 60, there's 70, there's 80, 90, and 100. And this is completely linear from black to white. It, it, it increases in 10% increments. Now, the trick here is uh, we're going to print this. So what you want to do is convert this now. Uh, and what I would do is use Edit, um, Convert to Profile. OK, and just make sure that you convert this into your working space. In my case, it's going to be sRGB. Now, the reason we create this in LAB is that it's much easier to get a completely linear step wedge here this, that steps in 10% increments. When we convert it, of course, the numbers aren't, you know, 10%, 20%. You can see, you know, 0 is still 0, but the 10% step is 27 RGB, reading the RGB values, 27. But you see the LAB value is still 10, and 48 and 10, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera as we go along. Now you would print this. So if we print this and then compare how the print looks to this screen display, you will learn a very interesting things about how prints differ from the way things display. For the most part, this step and this step will appear much darker in the print. So now, one of the things you can do when you when you open an image, let's uh, let's look at this image. So we have an image here that's a photograph, and if I move my cursor around, I can see the L value up here for any given area. So I look over here, and the L value is 92. So that's a bit bright. It's a it's but it's not absolutely paper white. Look at this L value. This is 81. How about this black value here? Well, that's 1. OK, so it's not 10 and it's not 0, but it's, it's, you know, it's close to 0. How about this? 21. So what you want to do is look at that printed version of the step wedge and compare how those values correlate to the, these values that you see in the image. And you can kind of decide, you know, this shadow value of his face is like 12, that's going to be really dark, almost black. But it doesn't look black on the monitor. So you have to kind of, you know, really uh, uh, look at the numbers and, and get a better idea of how things are going to print. Now, Photoshop has a way of changing the display that's supposed to simulate the way things look. So if we go under the View menu to Proof Setup, uh, we can select um, different types of uh, outputs. If we select, you know, our, our CMYK output, 
and then we select the proof colors. So we see uh, if you just hit Command Y, you'll go back and forth from your proof colors. And we're going to look at this blue here. That's going to change. Okay, so you can see it's not nearly as saturated. Uh, but the other thing is that what you really want to do is um, is modify this and make a custom proof setup. So in the in the custom proof setup, we can say, okay, simulate CMYK, but what we want to do is simulate the paper color. Okay, and you'll notice how drastically dull this got. All right, so the trick here is let's let's start off in uh, regular view. I've just done the command Y here. Now, if you look at this and you and you watch it change, you know it just looks horrible. It just looks dull. Okay, so what you want to do is turn away from the monitor and then change it and then come back. It still is going to look kind of dull, but it, it, if you don't see it change, it it, it actually uh, isn't as disturbing. But now you can kind of begin to get a sense that you know these low values in here are all going to kind of blend together. If I take the, the display off, it looks like there's so much rich detail in there. But when I put the, the custom display on, you can see when it prints, all of these things are going to get a lot closer together. So in, in some sense, it's, it's giving you a heads up about how much muddier your shadows are going to be. Uh, but it's really not an adequate rep, you know, uh, simulation of a print. So even though that, that tool is there, most people find it uh, less uh, useful. Uh, and I still think that reading the L values is going to tell you a lot more when you have an actual printed version of this step wedge to look at. So that's a, that's one method uh, that you can use if you're doing your own prints that will help you out uh, quite a bit. So I really highly encourage you to, to go through this procedure, play the video back uh, step by step, and uh, uh, see if you can't uh, create a step wedge for yourself. So we're finally at the end, exploded brains and all. Let's finish by picking up all that scattered brain tissue. Color management is a system that controls all color transforms in digital imaging, like when we convert from an RGB to a printer profile during the printing process, for instance. Capturing, editing, and outputting images require a whole chain of input, display, and output devices all controlled by software. All devices in the chain are linked through profiles that describe device colors using LAB color space. Without a profile description, no color transforms can occur. There is no way using modern imaging software to avoid color management. Most of the time, profiles that, are, that come into play in our imaging are at work behind the scenes, used automatically without our direct involvement. Monitors are the one device that absolutely must be profiled to achieve an ideal result. And we have to run a calibration and profile process on a regular basis. We have to make some choices about profiles in our work, notably with printer paper combinations and workspace defaults. And anytime there's an opportunity for choice, there's a chance for error. So this is basically where we have to be vigilant. So I hope that wasn't too horrible. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for watching. Be sure to visit my blog from time to time as I post free tutorials and have a large archive of useful art articles on my website at www.veris.com. Thank you for watching.